Welcome, Ram. Thanks so much for making it. I'm sorry we didn't catch up at Money 2020. Um, hope you enjoyed it, <laughs> as most uh, people did. And um, I was wondering if you could tell me a little bit about PR, Peer IQ and also about Cross River. Sure. First off, thank you for having me. I did enjoy Money 2020 as well. It's great to be great. back and see everyone in person. So Peer IQ is a data analytics business. You can think of it as the Bloomberg for loans for credit risk analytics. Our customers are asset managers, they're non-bank lenders and fintechs, and we had a long-standing commercial partnership uh, with uh, Cross River. And uh, Cross River, uh, for those in your audience that, that don't know, uh, Cross River acquired PeerIQ about nine months ago. And since I've been under the hood, I have to say it's really an extraordinary business. Cross River is a digital infrastructure bank. We're a B2B to C company, and we provide banking services to fintech companies, to crypto exchanges, to lenders in the buy now, pay later category and others, and to uh, really leading innovative companies. Those customers include Stripe, Plaid, Affirm, Upstart, Upgrade, Marlette. Uh, I could go on and on. Uh, Very impressive. And- Okay, um, so you, I, I hear you know a bit about crypto blockchain gaming, and of course, everyone wants to know about that. Do you want to uh, chime in on that? Sure. Yeah. Sure. So first off, our thesis around crypto is that it's fintech 3.0. If you look at how crypto is transforming payments with uh, stable coins, if you look at the total locked in value in DeFi, which is now over 100 billion dollars uh, and you look at the new customer experiences that are evolving and how uh, fintechs are adopting that uh, it's it's very clear that crypto is, is transforming uh, financial services within the crypto category there's a sector uh, you can think of as blockchain gaming and maybe one of the leading uh, blockchain games out there is called axie infinity which has been in the headlines the last couple of months although there have been Uh, quite a few new games launched recently. And what's really amazing about this category is that you're creating whole new economies with their own currency and their own avatars, characters, and heroes. And users can play to earn. They can earn a living uh, by playing a game. And this is very different than how gaming used to be when we grew up or when I grew up. You know, you might play a game and you turn off the computer or delete the software and all your work is lost. Uh, And now this is a new world, it's a new format. Uh, You can build uh, assets and inventory and trade and the assets you build, uh, you have a property right to, and it's on the blockchain and it's tradable and it enhances and enriches experience. And I think it's taking gaming, which is a very large industry, it's multiples the size of the entertainment or Hollywood industry. I think it's going to create a lot of uh, novel gaming experiences for years to come and i guess that leads into nfts what's what's your thoughts on nfts Uh, it's been quite a craze for uh, quite a few months right so i'll start with defining what nfts are so nfts are are non-fungible tokens and in the crypto space the idea of nfts really started with how can you take a physical asset in the real world let's say a house or a mortgage and attach it to a token and that token becomes a medium of exchange where you can convey value or enable two parties to transact uh, on the blockchain and the advantage or the vision there is how do we take the pain and friction of of transacting if anyone's ever bought a house before i'm sure you're familiar with uh, hundreds of pages of closing documents and uh, you know, dealing with mm-hmm. escrow and getting wire transfers done, you know, moving those transactions onto the blockchain and using NFTs is a really way to you know improve the customer experience. Now, what we're seeing today is NFTs have uh, really started to shape culture, and you're seeing artists and the creator economy uh, use NFTs to create uh, exclusive access to artists. So artists are re-engaging with their fan base in in new ways. Um, You're also seeing 
uh, creators utilize NFTs to distribute their music or their artwork. Now, what's really interesting about that is this, you know, historically, if say a music artist created a song, then there's a long line of intermediaries that record labels, publishers, distributors, and so forth that capture much of the economics along the way. So if you're, and if you're a breakout artist, you're not capturing the bulk of the value that you're creating. Uh, what's incredible about this NFT uh, market is that now for the first time, creators can participate in the economic gains from secondary sale transactions. Uh, and these creators can have a direct engagement with their audience and cut out intermediaries that are, you know, performing rent seeking or, you know, serving as, a, serving as a middleman, which is unnecessary in this new crypto market. It's very exciting stuff, really. Um, obviously, when I'm quite old and when I was young, um, musicians and artists were being ripped off left, right and centre by agents and managers and you know, all the middle people. So it, that's really inspiring and um, fantastic opportunity. And of course, the blockchain really has uh, provided things that we never expected. Uh, tell me a little bit about your opinion about DeFi and where we're heading with that. So DeFi is uh, an extraordinary opportunity for banks, for asset managers, for savers. So I'll start off with defining DeFi. DeFi stands for decentralized finance. And if you're a saver, you can earn 3% to 8%, depending on market conditions, for uh, lending on a fully secured basis on a decentralized blockchain let's say like Ethereum or Solana. Now, if you compare that to the yield you get at your local bank, you know, I have my funds at a, at a large mega bank and I only earn 0.05% each year. So in a negative real rate interest environment where we've seen inflation increase as well, DeFi creates an alternative for savers that's very attractive as compared to what they can get from the banking system. Uh, it's also, uh, you know, a great opportunity for community banks. So community banks are under increasing competition from fintechs and neo banks, as well as large money center banks that are investing tens and tens of billions in technology in online digital banking capabilities. There's an opportunity for community banks to make DeFi accessible to their end customer provided they can work out you know, the regulatory framework, which is an open issue, and have a good partner like Cross River uh, to help them along that journey. Wow. Yeah, it's very, very exciting stuff there. Um, I, I'm very interested in all the kerfuffle that Facebook is coming out with, and uh, I know you've got some opinions about that. Do you want to talk a bit about Metaverse and Facebook? <laughs> Sure. And anyone that's looked at the news uh, has seen that, you know, Facebook is rebranding to yeah. uh, Meta. And Facebook clearly is focused on the innovation in crypto. So take a step back. A few years ago, Facebook announced their intentions to launch the Libra currency. Yeah. That didn't go anywhere due to regulatory scrutiny. They're attempting to relaunch that under a, a trade association or uh, another organization called DM and now the metaverse. So what is the metaverse? It's a virtual reality where uh, individuals can interact, uh, they can represent themselves as avatars, and there are about 19 crypto metaverses that are decentralized. Decentraland is one of them, ETHverse goes on and on. So Facebook, now Meta, is betting the future on the metaverse. And if you look at today, anyone that has kids uh, that plays or interacts with Roblox or has seen their kids use Fortnite, you'll recognize that uh, newer generations are spending, I think the statistic I saw is 65% of their time online uh, in these new mediums. And so that's the future. It's not going to happen overnight. It's a journey. Mm. Uh, and I think it's, it's really extraordinary. You know, as a bank or as a fintech company, when you look at the metaverse, you have homes that are being bought and sold for $75,000 a piece. You have galleries, you have shopping malls, you have lounges. 
And you know, we think of that as commercial real estate or single family homes. And banks finance commercial real estate and single family homes, as well as artwork. And you know, we have an aspiration to be the first bank to finance a digital mortgage in the metaverse. I think it's an incredible opportunity. It's still early days. And it'll be very interesting to see how Facebook competes with these 19 and growing other decentralized uh, you know, metaverse communities. So I read an interesting article the other day um, by the founder of Second Life. And uh, he, he feels that um, from his experience, because obviously, you know, that was quite a few years ago, but um, from his experience, he just doesn't think that people will really take up on this. So what you're saying, though, is that younger generations are already um, enthused and involved in these communities. Uh, so what's your opinion about his his idea that it won't work? <laughs> you hit the nail on the head. There's a generational aspect to this. Right. So on Facebook, I'm old school also, and I'm dating myself by saying that I still use Facebook. And I guess I'm increasingly part of the boomer crowd. My parents are there as well. Yeah. And, you know, I'm also on Instagram, <laughs> right? So we're, we're also on Instagram. But the younger generation is on TikTok or Snapchat. Yes. yes. And, and it's a different experience. It's a different mode of expression of creating uh, a different kind of community and audience. And you're going to see more of that uh, specialization of uh, and niche markets with uh, products that are focused on these uh, audiences as opposed to one large monolithic social media company that attempts to be all things to all people. And so that's what the metaverse represents. It is, this is a bet on the future. And you're seeing it today, you know, there's uh, you know, gaming. I mentioned Fortnite, for example. Mm -hmm. Second Life is a great example of, um, you know, how this concept, you know, began uh, some yes. 10 plus years ago. Yeah. And um, so really, I think, though, that um, the positive out of this could be all this exposure, particularly since, um, you know, the crisis last year of the big tech companies um, and their uh, misuse of power is probably a, a nice little summary to say. Um, do you think that this will affect um people like Facebook, I mean, companies like Facebook, because they definitely haven't been doing the right thing as regards privacy and security and, um, you know, looking after the people that contribute to their platforms. It's, it's a great point. And this is a good transition to Web3 as a topic. So okay. there's, there's no question that all of the big tech companies are under scrutiny for all the issues you raised, right? The big tech companies have access to data through cookies, through mining email content, searches and keywords, IP addresses, and they're monetizing that in different ways uh, through ads, through uh, offering services such as in-home devices that uh, cause consumers to give up privacy. Now, what's interesting about crypto is that there's a new model emerging. And in this new model, consumers are in control of their identity. Their identity is linked to a virtual wallet. In fact, they could have multiple virtual wallets and multiple identities or pseudo identities, and the reputation can follow them on this virtual wallet, uh, and they can choose to permission certain providers to have access to their data. And, you know, think back to the Equifax credit card breach some time ago yep. as well. There are all sorts of ways big tech and other companies are monetizing consumer data in ways that consumers are just fed up with. And crypto is a, is a new model that gives them the economic sovereignty and control. Imagine, for example, if you have an email on a Web3 service, meaning it's decentralized, it's built on a blockchain, it's not intermediated by a large big technology company. Like Google. Someone wants to send you, exactly, right? <laughs> and, and imagine they send you spam and they've got to pay you ETH tokens for the privilege of sending you an email. Right. Instance, or an advertisement. Yeah. yeah. These are just some of the ways we can think about how user experiences you know, can be transformed. Yeah. So really, we're going into a whole new age. Um, 
thank you for opening the door and letting us look through that. Um, and is there anything else you'd like to talk about as far as where we're headed? Because uh, you've obviously got a lovely uh, bird's eye view of that. Sure. Well, the, the future is um, dynamic. It's an exciting time to be alive and live through this change. I think if you want to break into crypto, now is an extraordinary time to join an organization like Cross River or, or others and be a part of that change. Uh, I think it's causing us to rethink how we relate to one another. I think some of these trends were accelerated uh, with COVID as well. And new business models are being formed. There are new ways of interacting, for communicating, for trading, for transacting, for doing uh, banking, for consuming content, for distributing content. Crypto is changing all of that. It hasn't felt like this since the emergence of like the dot-com technology. Yeah. And there was a lot of hype around that, uh, but it clearly has transformed how we live and work today. I'm sure crypto has gone and will continue to go through these cycles. And there's a lot of promise in you know what I see from uh, this vantage point. A brave new world. <laughs> yeah. Thank you, Ram. This has been a totally interesting and entertaining. I appreciate all your overview and uh, hopefully we'll get you back on the show down the line. My pleasure. And thank you for the great questions. Terrific. Okay. Have a good one. Bye. Bye-bye.